But in, t in terms of what the talk is about, as the slide says, company directors and their duties post Sequana, um, it's actually in some ways, I think, easier to say what the talk is not about. It's it's not about the duties that directors owe to the membership of the company as a as a whole when the company is solvent. Um, that duty is uh, well established um, and partially codified within the provisions of the Companies Act. Rather, what this talk is about is the duties that directors of companies owe to those other than the membership of the company as a whole. And essentially, there, there are two constituencies that we're going to look at. The first, which Richard is, is going to focus on and probably take up a, um, a, a rather smaller part of the talk, is the duties that uh, directors of companies may owe to individual members, that is, members that owe, owe to a member personally rather than to, to the members as a class. And then secondly, and importantly, it is a talk on the duties that directors of companies that are in a state of financial distress owe to the creditors as a class. And we're going to refer to that as a as the creditor duty. There's a slight difficulty of language here in that um, whilst Lord Briggs uh, and Lord Hodge both described this duty as the creditor's duty in Sequana, uh, Lady Arden uh, and also Lord Reed were uh, rather more reticent and called it the rule in West Mercia. And the reason for that was to highlight the fact that there is in fact no freestanding duty that is owed to uh, a creditor individually or as part of a class. The duty is always a duty owed to the company and it is a question of what the company is equated with, whose interests the company is equated with. So it's it's not a not a freestanding duty, but we're going to refer to it uh, as the creditor duty. Um, Sequana it, it, it was handed down, I think, on the sixth or the fifth of October uh, of this year. Um, it, it is, well, to my mind, it's a very interesting case. It's a long decision, 136 pages, four judgments. Um, and it's interesting, first of all, because it gives, uh, as has already been indicated, welcome clarification on a number of issues um, and also identifies where the law uh, may travel as things go forward. But it's also worth reading, first of all, because it, uh, it, it looks at the various different stakeholders. Well, there's commentary on the various different stakeholders and the relationship that they have with one another. That is to say, the members, the directors, the creditors of a company, um, and also other stakeholders, those those groups listed in subsection one of 172 of the Companies Act, uh, people such as suppliers, uh, employees, and, and, and all, all of whom uh, are, are stakeholders in, in the company. And it's also interesting, and you get this particularly from Lady Arden's judgment, uh, because there's, a, there's an extensive discussion um, on the thinking behind and the consul, uh, consultative bodies report on the purposes that the Companies Act uh, is seeking to achieve and in particular the concept uh, of enlightened shareholder value which the 2006 Act uh, sought to give effect to. So those, those are all that they're outside those last two points are outside the scope of this talk but I, I just note them as as points that are interesting uh, that, that that can be found within uh, the judgment. But uh, yeah, Richard is 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 going to uh, speak to the duties that uh, are owed to individual shareholders. Thanks, Jamie. Yes, obviously, as Jamie says, the focus of the talk is on the creditor duty uh, uh, following the reconsideration by Sequana. I just wanted to touch briefly on on the circumstances in which a, a company director may be held to owe fiduciary duties to to individual shareholders. And the focus of the talk, whichever we're talking about, the creditor duty or the shareholder duty, is is on the the general duties in Chapter Two of Part Ten of the Act. So, um, most obviously, the 
the duty under section 172 to promote the interests of the shareholders as a whole. Um, and, and, and the short answer to the question, well, to whom do directors owe those duties, is actually given in the Act because it says in terms uh, in section 170 subsection 1 um, that the, uh, the duties are owed to the company. Now, although it's long been recognised that the company has a, a distinct uh, legal personality apart from its shareholders, thinking back to one's law school days, cases like Solomon and so forth, um, it's, it's been traditionally accepted and assumed, at least in the context of, of director's duties, um, that for the purposes of, of enforcing those duties and, and, and looking at who they're owed to, the, the company to whom they're owed will usually be um, equated with the general body of, of shareholders. Um, and we see that that also has statutory force in Section 172 of the Act, which provides that, that the director must act in a way uh, he considers or she considers in good faith uh, would be most likely to promote the um, interests of the, well, the success of the company for the benefit of the members as a whole. So that's uh, some statutory recognition of the interests of shareholders. Um, and the the equiparation of the company with the body of shareholders is also uh, recognised or reinforced by the fact that um, uh, even where there's a board of directors, as there always is, the, the shareholders can, by formal resolution or unanimous informal resolution, um, uh, bind the company and indeed even waive or, or authorise what would otherwise be breaches of duty by a director. Now, um, as we'll go on to explain, and as you, you're all no doubt aware now, but, um, the Supreme Court has very recently um, affirmed the existence of the creditor duty. Um, but what I wanted to look at, as I say very briefly, is the circumstances in which the directors will owe uh, duties to individual shareholders. Now, um, even the duty, even when we say, and the company is wholly solvent, solvent and, the, and the duty is said to be owed to the company represented by the body of shareholders, that does not mean that individual shareholders can enforce that duty. Um, they can't. Um, the only way they could effectively do that is by way of a derivative action or something of that nature. Um, but there are cases where individual shareholders have sought to bring claims against directors for breach of fiduciary duty. And um, one of them is a case called Peskin and Anderson back in 2001. Um, I don't know if anyone's read that. It, it involved the RAC Club, which is quite a, a nice club on Pall Mall. I think it's well known for its marble swimming pool and things like that. Um, and what had happened there was there was a demutualization of the club and the club was part of, uh, it had a holding company, but it also had another, there was another company within the group, or maybe not another company, but another business which controlled the RAC motoring arm, which was quite lucrative. And um, what had happened was um, a number of shareholders who had failed, or members of the club who had failed to renew their membership or, or the membership had lapsed or had been terminated, um, after they left, the demutualization process took place and all the members of the club who were then members got paid out about £34,000. And the members who'd left beforehand then jumped up and down and said, well, you must have known, you directors must have known that this was in the offing. Why didn't you tell us about it? Because we, would um, we wouldn't have surrendered our membership and we, you've deprived us of the opportunity of, of participating in that windfall payment. And so they sought to run a case that the directors were uh, owed those shareholders individually uh, a fiduciary duty, essentially one of disclosure of information. And um, the, the, the claim was the subject of a strikeout application that was heard at first instance by Mr Justice Newberg, as he then was, and um, it then went on appeal because he, he allowed the um, strikeout and said that the directors didn't owe any duties in the particular circumstances. Now, um, what the Court of Appeal did say, uh, I think the main judgment was given by Lord Justice Mummery, he said that um, it wasn't in dispute that, that a director may owe a duality of duty, so he may owe duties to the, or she may owe duties to the general body of shareholders, but in special circumstances, a director may also owe fiduciary duty uh, to individual shareholders personally. Um, but that sort of duty, that individual duty, is not derived from anything in the Act. Uh, it's not derived from the the legal relationship of a, of, a, of a director to the shareholder, to the company. Rather, to, to get a case like that off the ground, one would have to show um, a, a special factual relationship between the, the individual or the relevant directors and the individual uh, complaining shareholders. And essentially what that required was um, 
an assumption of responsibility by those directors towards the individual shareholders. And essentially, that really boils down to direct contact between them uh, in relation to a, a particular transaction or holding themselves out to, uh, as the agents of those individual shareholders and so forth. And in those circumstances, there might be a duty of disclosure. Now, um, the, uh, as I say, in, at first instance, in front of Newbury and in the Court of Appeal, they said there was simply nothing in the, in the, on the facts to give rise to that special relationship. In particular, there were no relevant dealings, no communications between the, the directors and the individual shareholders. Um, the actions of the board had not um, contributed or caused the members to retire when they did. And there was simply, in any event, nothing, nothing in terms of proposals about disposal of the of the, uh, the motoring arm that was sufficiently concrete or definite to disclose anyway. By the time most of them had relinquished their membership, so that case failed. And there have been a number of other cases where where similar claims have been failed. There was a, a, a fairly well known one involving, um, I think, the board of um, Lloyd's Bank, was it? Sir Victor Sharp was one of the main defendants, a case called Sharp, oh sorry, Sir Victor Blank. And that was uh, a well-known case that I've put in the notes, Sharp and Blank. And essentially, he reiterated that, that owing duties to individual shareholders doesn't arise out of the, the mere occupation of office by a shareholder. That's not going to be enough. And even though, as one would expect, a, share, a director would have more knowledge about the company's affairs compared with um, many shareholders, that uh, that isn't enough either, um, because that is their job. They direct and control the company for the benefit of the shareholders, who, who usually have a pretty um, hands-off uh, involvement. Um, and he he went on uh, in that case, just trying to think, I think it was Mr. Justice Lewis, and was it? No, Nugi, as he then was. Um, and he said, he tried to give some guidance about the circumstances in which uh, such a duty might arise. And he said, typically, it would be uh, small, closely held companies, particularly in the context of a, of a family and so forth, um, because there's more likely to be direct personal contact, I guess, between the board and individual shareholders, shareholders in those circumstances. Uh, a very recent case, 2022, a case called Kelly and Bark, a Baker, which is in the notes, Mr. Justice Cockerell uh, noted, noted the truth of that in terms of the the existence of a close relationship is more likely to trigger uh, uh, or give rise to a, a special relationship, but said actually it's the close relationship which is the hallmark of a fiduciary relationship um, and the fact that, um, or sorry, the close relationship is not um, a, a necessary hallmark of a, of, a, of a fiduciary relationship. It's simply a situation in which it's more likely objectively that one party will have reposed trust and confidence in the other, namely the directors. So, um, it's not unheard of for claims to succeed on that basis, but it is unusual. And um, uh, I've read other cases where, you know, very prominent um, silks have had their cases struck out for failure to um, plead and establish the relevant special relationship. But um, that's just always a, a, a sort of uh, a, 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 an amuse bouche before the main course, because that we're, we're not really amusing either. But what we're really talking about is the is the credit duty, which I think. Um, I'm now talking about two, Jamie. Is that right? No, I think it's it's me next. No, is it okay? Yep. Um, so yeah, this is uh, the, the creditor duty, and and really the, as Richard says, the main focus of the talk, the decision uh, of the Supreme Court in Sequana. Um, as you see from the slide, five person constitution heard uh, uh, heard the case over. I think it was two days. It went ahead remotely. Uh, back in, in 2021. Um, and the one of the central issues in Sequana was whether the creditor duty even exists at all. Um, and to some, uh, perhaps myself included at first thought, this seems um, rather surprising. The creditor duty uh, is well established. Everyone on this uh, on, on this call or, or meeting has probably been involved in cases which are reliant upon the existence of such duty. Uh, but nevertheless, the defendant directors in this case uh, argued one of their lines of arguments was that there was no such duty. The um, the, the directors of a financially distressed company could never 
owe a duty to consider the interests of the creditors, uh, it was said. Um, whilst that might perhaps seem surprising, in fact, there are a number of reasons, number of good reasons, I would suggest, as to why that, that argument had real merit. First of all, there was previous, albeit somewhat old, Court of, uh, Court of Appeal authority, which was incompatible with the existence of such duty. Uh, and the case uh, was um, a decision called uh, Re uh, Wintham, Wincham, sorry, Re Wincham, um, a case decided back in 1878. Um, the second reason is that the existence of a such duty has been uh, the subject of sustained and, and fairly trenchant academic uh, criticism over the years. Uh, it's also the case that the existence of such a, a duty is a relatively recent innovation of the common law. It was first um, articulated or found to exist in the decision of the Court of Appeal in West Mercia Safety Wear and Dodd, in 1988. And it's also notable uh, that other common law jurisdictions, notably Delaware, the United States, uh, or states of the United States of America, and also Canada, have all uh, declined to acknowledge or accept that there is such duty. And it was against that backdrop that the defendant directors were seeking to argue in the Supreme Court that there was no such duty. Uh, as the facts of Sequana, uh, it concerned a company, AWA, uh, which had uh, some uh, or had substantial, potentially substantial contingent liabilities that he owed by way of indemnities that it had given uh, for environmental cleanup costs and also penalties that might be imposed in relation to that cleanup uh, in relation to operations that had uh, taken place in America. In addition to those uncertain but potentially extensive liabilities, it also had a valuable asset class of indeterminate uh, value, uh, no, uh, mainly a, um, a suite of insurance policies that had been incepted with a view to guard against the possibility that these uh, environmental liabilities might crystallise. In about 2008, I, I think it was, it caused two um, very, or the directors of AWA, caused two uh, substantial dividend payments to be made to its uh, parent company, the sole shareholder, I think, in AWA, uh, and the parent was Sequana. Uh, at the time that those uh, payments were made, those dividend payments were made, the distributions were made. Uh, AWA was first of all solvent um, and secondly it was found not to be likely or it wasn't probable that it was going to be insolvent at some point in the future, albeit that there was a real risk of future insolvency at some uh, indeterminate time to come. Um, the distributions that were made were, by the time matters got to the Supreme Court, accepted to have been lawful in the sense that they complied with Part 23 of the Companies Act and also the common law rules on uh, capital adequacy. Uh, at first instance, the uh, payment BTI 2014, a SPV that was incorporated for the purposes of bringing the litigation as an assignee um, was successful uh, as against Sequana uh, on a 423 claim uh, but was unsuccessful against the director defendants on the breach of duty claim on the basis that at the time that the distributions had been made the accredited duty had not yet arisen they, 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 the directors were not at that point in time required to be considering the creditors' interests because uh, insolvency was was too remote an event and wasn't sufficient. Uh, the real risk wasn't sufficient to trigger uh, the duty. Uh, the Court of Appeal upheld 
uh, Mrs Justice Rose's first instance decision. Um, and the uh, the claimant appealed to the Supreme Court for the Supreme Court's permission. Um, the issues for the Supreme Court, I'm sorry, uh, were, were fourfold. First of all, there was that key central issue. Was there, in fact, as a matter of English law, a duty to consider the creditor's interests when the, co if the company was financially distressed? The second issue, which to my mind is, 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 a, is a freestanding point, is whether the payment of an otherwise lawful dividend could ever give rise to a breach of duty by a director. The third issue was uh, when was when was the uh, duty triggered? And that was the issue on which the claimant had, had found it failed uh, at both first instance and on appeal to the Court of Appeal. And then fourthly, necessarily over to what is the content of that duty? What does it require a director to do? Um, I'm just going to quickly look at the legal backdrop to this decision before Richard explain, uh, addresses the first and second of those issues. The first case is the one that I've already referred to, Re Wincham. Um, this was uh, this was a case where the directors uh, who were also shareholders of an insolvent company caused payments to be made uh, in diminution of the bank uh, of, of the company's overdrawn bank account, a bank account that they were uh, or an overdraft that they were personally guarantors for, such that the payment. Um, by the company reduce their own personal exposure. Um, and at first instance, um, the court was persuaded, I think it was uh, Vice Chancellor Bacon VC, was persuaded that uh, by, by doing what they had done, the directors had acted in breach of trust. Um, directors appealed uh, to the Court of Appeal and the Master of the Rolls, Jessel MR, um, with the agreement of other members of the court, uh, held that in fact there was no breach of trust. Uh, and as you see from the side, he, the court of appeal accepted doubtless uh, that directors uh, uh, owed trustee-like duties to the company. But the real question is who is the company? Who do they owe these duties to? Uh, and it was not, in the view of the court of appeal, the creditors. The creditors are not the company, they've got contractual rights, uh, but little more than that. The credit that the company is the membership uh, as a whole. And the Supreme Court analysed the, uh, the basis for this as, as resting on two, uh, two principles. First of all, the direct uh, the shareholders are the corporators of the company. They, they cause it to exist. And secondly, they have the power, the voting rights to appoint the directors such that the duty that the directors owe should be viewed as a direct uh, duty owed to the membership as a whole. But it is not, in the view of the Court of Appeal back in 1878, a duty to creditors. And as I said earlier on, I think it was it was common ground in the Supreme Court that this was incompatible with the idea of a creditor duty. And that really, I think, is where the uh, law stayed in this jurisdiction, at least, until the late 1980s. Um, and then when we have in 1986, the decision of um, uh, an Australian decision, one of a number actually where a credit duty was found to exist in Kinsella. Um, and what was said by street CJ in that case, and you see it on the slide, is that whilst where the company is solvent, the duties are owed to the members as a whole, as a whole when the company becomes insolvent, the interests of the creditors intrude. Uh, they become prospectively entitled through the mechanism of liquidation to displace the power of the shareholders and directors still with the company's assets. Uh, and in a practical sense, 
they're their asset, assets and not the shareholders assets uh, and this um, for, for, for street CJ uh, was enough to give rise to a duty to consider and act in the creditors interests and that takes us to the decision of the Court of Appeal in West Mercia and uh, West Mercia Safety Wear and Dodd um, where the Court of Appeal in relatively short judgment uh, approved in effect the decision in Kinsella as being an accurate statement uh, of English law and applied uh, and found that that duty, that the creditor duty existed. And then we have a, a whole series of, of cases that follow follow that, many of which uh, everyone will be familiar with, where um, the creditor duty has been relied upon, uh, mainly in the in the high court, but also the more senior courts, uh, as as being the basis for imposing liability uh, on on directors. Um, the, the next uh, milestone. Uh, to be aware of, I think, is the Companies Act uh, in 2006 um, and Section 172 in particular. So you'll see from the side subsection one, we have a statutory recognition that the directors of company have a duty to promote uh, the success of the, of the company for the benefit of the members of the company as a whole. Um, and that that accords with that uh, re Winsham type of reasoning that the membership of the company as a whole is 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 to be equated with the company in most circumstances. But then we've got subsection three and that provision makes it makes it clear that that uh, duty is subject um, uh, to 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 uh, uh, an obligation to consider acts in the interests of creditors of the company where there is an enactment or rule of law that requires the directors to do so. Um, I'm not aware and more importantly the Supreme Court's not aware of any enactment but we do have the rule described as the rule in West Mercia which uh, requires the directors to um, give consideration in certain circumstances as to, as, uh, to creditor interests namely where the company is insolvent. That takes us to the uh, first issue that the uh, Supreme Court had to address. Yes, now j just in terms of just to orientate people and remind them about about the facts of it, as Jamie said, there were, there were initially two claims brought. One was under Section 423. That was against the recipient of the dividend, Sequana. And that, and then the second claim was against the directors for cause of allowing those dividends to be paid. The reason why the by pursuit of the, the director's claim was so important was because um, in the events which happened, Sequana was, un was unable to meet any judgment under the under the 423 claim against it. So there was going to be no recovery unless um, the, the claimant could establish a claim against the directors. And of course, that's one of the issues that um, occupied quite a bit, I think, of the of the judgment and certainly the submissions in, in the court at first instance, and I think in the Court of Appeal, which was the question was whether um, payment of a div dividend could ever be a transaction at an undervalue, um, because obviously under Section 423, one has to show the existence of a, of a transaction at an undervalue and the prohibited statutory purpose. And um, uh, that was resolved um, in, in favour of the claimant that a, a dividend could be a transaction at an undervalue, and that, that didn't feature in the in the Supreme Court appeal at all. But it was because of that that need to pursue the directors um, to, to make a valuable recovery that the, that the appeal was pursued. Um, and just in terms of the issues, uh, the first issue, the, the, to succeed in the appeal, the claimant had to establish this duty um, on the directors to have regard to the interests of the creditors because, um, as Jamie's already said, at the time the dividends were made, Sequana was undoubtedly solvent. And because um, the, the, the impugned dividends were made 10 years before the claim, um, the claimant had to show that any duty to creditors um, had to be triggered um, even when the company was solvent um, 
um, and they had to, uh, and they, because the way the test has been framed in, in all the other cases, such as West Merch and so on, it's all been any creditor duty has been has been tied to the fact of insolvency or the imminence of insolvency. And because of that 10 year gap, it was important for, for the claimant to persuade the Supreme Court that the duty could be triggered uh, even when uh, insolvency wasn't imminent. But so long as there was what they did, they, they, the, the formulation of the test they wanted the Supreme Court to accept was that um, there was a, a real but not remote risk of becoming insolvent at some point in the future. And in their case, some 10 years in the future. And as Jamie said, that the response of the defendant directors was was what um, I think Lord Briggs described as a full frontal uh, attack on the very existence of any creditor duty. And um, as Jamie said, um, the, the recognition of such a duty is, is relatively recent in, in this jurisdiction, dating back to, as he said, the sort of mid 1980s, 1988 West Mercia. Um, and um, other cases have not really cast any doubt about the existence of that duty. Later cases, and there have been quite a few, um, but they have sort of tinkered about the, the tr they have tinkered with the semantics about what the trigger is for that duty to arise. So whatever formulation of the test there is, as I said, they've all been tied to, it's either insolvent, and if it's insolvent, uh, if the company's insolvent, then, then the duty does arise. No one was in any doubt about that. It's just the question of, of, of how far back one can go before insolvency, before it may be said that the, the duty is triggered. So, as I say, the, the test or the, the duty seemed not to be in much doubt. It was just the semantics of, uh, of, of, the, of the trigger point, if it was going to be something other than actual insolvency. And um, in Sequana, I think all of the justices gave reasoned judgments, apart from Lord Kitchen, who, who elected to agree with, um, with Lord Briggs and associated himself with, with that judgment. Um, and you'll see, if you read the various judgments, that there's quite a lot of um, exploration by the, the, the judges um, as to the sort of justifications that have been given over time for the existence of a duty and so forth. But, but ultimately, Lord Briggs said um, that um, the existence, rather than the denial of a, of a, of a creditor duty in some form, um, was more consistent with both company law, as reflected in the 2006 Act, and was and with insolvency law as codified in the Insolvency Act. And I think what he was talking about there was um, partly section 172 uh, of the Companies Act, and in the context of insolvency, provisions such as section 214, wrongful trading and, and things of that nature. And, um, but he also said, despite, well, in addition to the sort of legislative support for the existence of, of accredited duty, what he also said was that such a duty was uh, more consistent with the development of the corporate rescue culture, uh, in which securing cooperation of the of the creditors of a distressed company, um, rather than ignoring them, can uh, make all the difference to the uh, success or failure of, of a of a business. And ultimately, what what Lord Briggs said that because he did he did recognise that some of the arguments against the existence of a creditor duty creditor duty were quite formidable. But ultimately, what he said that was in his view. There were two two compelling reasons in favour of affirming the existence of a duty, and um, first was this strong line, what he called a strong line of authority, uh, not just in England but in in um, New Zealand and Australia, um, from the mid 1980s, which affirmed the existence of that duty. Um, although, as he says, albeit with some uh, ambiguities or uncertainties about the scope of the duty, the content, and um, and when it when it might arise. Um, and then secondly, he said, and, and in Lord Briggs's view conclusively, he said the existence of the duty was um, evident from or affirmed by the terms of section 173, uh, 1713, of, oh, sorry, 1723 of the Act, which we looked at with Jamie a short time ago, which just to remind you, that says that the duty under section 1721, which is the duty to promote the success of the um, company for the benefit of the shareholders as a whole, that that duty has effect um, subject to, and the wording is subject to any enactment or rule of law requiring directors in certain circumstances to consider or act in the interests of creditors of the company. Now, in relation to section 172, there's quite a lot of discussion about how that came to be, be in the act and what it means. Um, and 
Lady Arden, who in some ways, although agreeing with the broad thrust of the the decisions that were ultimately, or the, or the conclusions that the court ultimately reached, she did diverge from the uh, some of the provisional views and some of the reasoning adopted by the others. And it, in some ways, it's quite ironic because she was probably the judge with the most experience of company law. She was a member of the steering group that um, revised and looked at revisions of the company law, and which ultimately led to the 2006 Act. And it seemed to be, I think, accepted that the reason, certainly she said it was, that the reason that the uh, Section 1723 is worded in the way that it was, was because some of the members of the steering group could not agree that there was such a duty and certainly couldn't agree as to its scope. And so it was left uh, uh, slightly woolly uh, in the way it was put in the Act. But ultimately, Lord Briggs said that um, that um, reference to the to the uh, the duty of common law to take into account um, creditors' interest was for him conclusive about the existence of it. The fact that the statute recognised it was conclusive. Um, and Whereas, whereas I say, as I say, Lady Arden almost thought that that subsection should be read as if the words "if any" had had been had been used to qualify the duty, but um, uh, Lord Briggs didn't agree. Lord Hodge agreed with um, Lord Briggs about those what he regarded as those two compelling um, reasons. Um, and um, but ultimately, they all agreed, as as Jamie said, that there's there's no freestanding duty um, in respect of of creditors. It's simply um, it's not an incident of the of the of the primary duty under section 172, but it is a modification of that duty that requires directors to look also to the interests of creditors in certain circumstances. Um, as Jamie said, there's a bit of a change in, in sort of phraseology and the or variation in, in phraseology in the judgment. Um, the majority, or not the majority, but I suppose Lord Briggs and Lord Kitchen um, Refer to as the creditor duty, but others prefer to record it, record it as the as the West Mercia duty. Um, there's there's some other interesting um, stuff in the judgment about the in the context I think of the existence of the duty, which is all to do with consideration of things like um, well provisions like Section two one four in the Insolvency Act for wrongful trading, and also interestingly Section two three nine of the Insolvency Act, which is to do with unlawful preferences. Now, there are cases where, and in fact, West Mercer and Dodd was one, where the, the relevant um, transaction was what we would recognise as an unlawful transaction at an undervalue. The reason in West Mercer why they pursued the directors for bringing that about was, again, because I think the counterparty to the preference under the statutory predecessor to Section 239 had gone pop, so there was no going to be valid, no valuable relief against that entity. So that's why they had to turn their attention to the directors. Um, and so there are, uh, it is accepted that a transaction, at an un, uh, sorry, a transaction which is a, an unlawful preference within Section 239 may give rise not only to a claim against the recipient of that preference, which is what a lot of us do on a fairly regular basis, but also may also give rise to a claim against the director for breach of fiduciary duty, but not necessarily. And there are a number of authorities which have looked at this. Um, and so um, there may be, for, may be, for example, that a claim under Section 239 is not, not possible because the transaction occurred outside the relevant relation back period or one of the other conditions in Section 239 isn't satisfied. Um, but, but it is the case that um, even where a preference under Section 239 is made out, um, the directors who caused that or allowed it to take place will not necessarily automatically thereby be treated as in breach of fiduciary duty. And there's a lot of cases, well, there's quite a body of case law about this. And if a claim, for example, is to be pursued against the directors, they don't get, the, the claimant doesn't get the benefit of the, the statutory presumptions that exist in section 239, where the claim is against the recipient. The, 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 the duty has to be made out without uh, without reliance on those presumptions, but what um, what the court the courts are clear about is that um, the fact that an unlawful preference was given does not automatically render the directors to be in breach, because as a, as the court observed in an earlier case called um, Brian uh, Pearson contractors, that would effectively be saying that directors um, simply have a duty not not to allow Section two three nine. Uh, 
to be breached. And that that approach uh, that um, has now been reinforced by by something Lord Reed said in Sequana. He said the fact that one credit is paid in preference to others at a time when the company is insolvent or bordering on insolvency will not be a breach of fiduciary duty if the directors believe in good faith that they are acting in the interest of the company understood in accordance with the rule in West Mercia. For example, because they have decided on the basis that it is in the company's interest to continue trading and therefore need to pay particular creditors. Now, I suppose one could say that um, in those circumstances, even a claim under Section 239 might be unsuccessful because the uh, the um, purpose of, of effect, effectively putting that creditor in a better position wouldn't have been the purpose behind the transaction. But um, anyway, it, it, it is now, I think, certainly well established that it's not necessarily going to be a breach if... Um, if Section 239 is, pre is breached, it won't necessarily be a breach of fiduciary duty. But one of the things that courts have struggled with a bit is if there is a claim under Section 239, which also gives rise to a claim against a director for breach of fiduciary duty, what is, what is the remedy? And the reason why this has caused problems is that unless the director who caused or allowed it, um, him or herself benefited from that, tra that transaction in some way, then what is the company's loss? Because if a, if a company simply pays from its own resources a debt, the balance sheet of that company is not affected in any way. It's simply exchanging uh, an asset for the for the uh, the um, elimination of a liability. And so some courts have struggled with trying to understand even if you had a even if uh, you had a claim against the director for causing that preference. What what loss could the company be said to have suffered? Because of course, ultimately, in the context of a breach of fiduciary duty, one normally has two remedies: disgorgement by the director of any benefit, or compensation for the loss caused to the company. And if the director personally didn't benefit from from any preferential payment, you're rather stuck with looking at compensation. And there are a number of cases um, where this has been considered a fairly well known one called GHLM against Maru, where Mr. Justice. Uh, Newey, as he then was, sounded a note of caution about that. But um, in Sequana, Lord Reed did look at this in a bit of detail. He he expressly refrained from expressing a definitive uh, resolution of this, but he did indicate a provisional view in favour of the um, of an order uh, of the kind made in West Mercia, and, and as was followed in the later case of HLC. And essentially, that form of order was to require the director who caused the payment. Uh, to um, restore the payment to the company, but be allowed to prove in the company as a creditor for the amount of that payment, um, so, that the, so that essentially the, that he is no worse off than he would have, or the company is no worse off than it would have been had the payment not been made. Um, but that was only his provisional view, and it, it's not something that all the members of the of the court uh, looked at. Um, now, so. Um, ultimately, as I say, they were they were unanimous about the existence of this duty, um, and they were also unanimous unanimous about rejection of the idea that there was a duty that was triggered um, by the by the existence of a of a of a of a remote risk of insolvency of a real but not necessarily remote risk of insolvency. Now, the next slide this. Uh, is, is, is raises this question of whether a, a dividend that is otherwise lawful uh, could nonetheless uh, give rise to or involve a breach of fiduciary duty. Now, this this issue was disposed of relatively briefly in the judgments. Um, Lord Briggs, um, and uh, with whom Lord Reid expressly agreed on this issue, um, relied on two reasons for saying that the the creditor duty recognised by the Supreme Court did apply uh, potentially in the context of an otherwise lawful distribution. And the first of those reasons was Section one, uh, Section 8511 of the Act, which, um, uh, wrong, which um, provides, subject to two very narrow exceptions where the um, dividend or distribution is not made in cash, but, but um, distributions in kind, accepting those, those limited situations, um, the provisions, uh, what Section 8511 does is, is provide that the provisions of Part 23 of the 2006 Act, which is the 
the scheme, the statutory uh, regime for making uh, dividends and so forth, those are without prejudice um, to any rule of law restricting the sums out of which or the circumstances in which a distribution may be made and the creditor duty uh, um, was such a rule of law, according uh, to the court. So in other words, even though the directors might have conscientiously looked at the, the, la the relevant accounts, which will usually be the, the most recent account, um, and made a decision based on the distribut distributable profits that there was a sufficient basis for paying a dividend, they nonetheless also had to uh, ask themselves, well, is the company solvent and so forth? Are we at risk of, 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 of ignoring creditors' interest? Because often these the, the relevant accounts are somewhat out of date by the time the decision to pay the dividend is made. And it's not just a question of being satisfied by compliance with Part 23 that the dividend should be paid. One has to have regard to your director's duties as well. Um, the second, and, and this sort of feeds into the second reason that Lord Briggs identified, which is that um, the, the Part 23 regime is really focused on balance sheet insolvency. Um, yet it could be the case that where you have a company that's balance sheet solvent, but on a, on a cash flow or commercial insolvency basis, as unable to, to, to pay its creditors, uh, or unable to pay its debts as they fall due. And, and he had no hesitation in saying that a director who authorizes or permits a, a dividend to be made in those circumstances uh, would be in breach of duty. I think it's back to you now, Jamie. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, this that takes us to the third issue, which is uh, what, uh, sorry, when or in what circumstances will the creditor duty be triggered? Um, and as Richard has, has been discussing, uh, this important question of whether a real risk of insolvency is sufficient to trigger the creditor duty. Um, and this, uh, as I've already said, it was important because this was the issue that the claimant's case had founded on twice before um, and uh, did so for the third time, excuse me, in the Supreme Court. Um, all members of the Supreme, Supreme Court re rejected real risk of insolvency as the appropriate trigger. And the reason for that is essentially one of remoteness. What the what the court was doing was looking at the point in time at which the uh, interests of the various constituencies uh, changed, such as to make uh, the creditors a stakeholder and ultimately to stop the uh, members of the company as a whole being stakeholders in the company um, and the time at which the members seemed ceased to have any interest, uh, economic interest in the company was the point at which liquidation, insolvent liquidation or administration became inevitable. Um, and for Lord Briggs, the, the, the possibility of insolvency was a stage of remove too far away uh, apart from that point in time when um, when the members lost uh, any economic interest in the company. Uh, and you'll see his preferred formulation on the slide. Uh, what, what, we, what he said was necessary was imminent insolvency or a probability of an insolvent liquidation. And then uh, importantly as well, you've got the words about which the directors know or ought to know. Um, and you, you then have a, a, a similar formulation um, from uh, Lady Arden with which Lord Reed agreed, uh, which is uh, insolvent or bordering on insolvency or probable insolvent liquidation, but with the notable omission of any any knowledge requirement. Um, so all, all members of the Supreme Court are saying, I don't think necessarily over to her, but it is helpful guidance as to what the trigger point is, is when insolvency is imminent, close proximity to insolvency being the idea behind that, I think, 
uh, or otherwise uh, where insolvent liquidation is probable. That raises two questions. Uh, the first of those is what is insolvency? Um, and various members of the Supreme Court made clear that they'd had few sub submissions on this issue and their view was very much provisional. But for the majority, insolvency was taken as being uh, insolvency within the definition found in Section 122 of the Insolvency Act, namely cash flow insolvency or commercial insolvency, as it was termed uh, in some of the judgments, or balance sheet in insolvency. Um, uh, uh, Lady Arden um, uh, spent, a bit more, spent a bit more time upon uh, this issue than the other judges. Uh, she noted the breadth of the factors that are to be taken into account when establishing whether a company uh, is cash flow and solvent, noted that there was uncertainty in that process, which is unhelpful for directors seeking to discharge their, their duty, but deciding that um, that was perhaps a, an issue for Parliament rather than the court. Um, but interestingly, she also suggested that the directors of a company may not owe a duty to creditors where the company is insolvent, but the insolvency is of a cash flow na nature uh, and it's only likely to be temporary. So it's possible, um, yet to be decided, but possible that a, that a, that a, that a transaction may or a, 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 direct, a director that enters into a transaction which is detrimental to creditor interests at a time when the company is cash flow insolvent but likely to only remain insolvent for, for temporary on a temporary basis will not be found to be in breach of, of their duties but it's it's a point yet to be determined. Uh, the second question is uh, the extent of the knowledge required so uh, indicated on in relation to the previous start, slide for Lord Briggs uh, it was new or ought to know uh, of the company's financial situation. Um, Lady Arden questioned that. She, she, while well, she accepted that a later, at a later stage in the process, it, it may be necessary to show that the director knew or ought to know uh, the company's financial position in order to establish paramountcy of share, uh, creditor interests, which we'll come to. For, for the mere trigger point uh, of the duty, it might not actually be necessary that the director ought to know. If the director didn't, uh, didn't know and had good reason for not knowing, it may be that the, they, look, they look to Section 157 of the Companies Act and the relieving provision uh, uh, as, as a, as a uh, way of limiting or removing their liability as opposed to question the very existence of the duty. So that's that's another matter that will uh, fall to be determined in due course. The fourth issue for the court was what uh, was the con content of the, uh, of the duty? What did it what is, did it involve? Um, um, for the majority, the duty was one to weigh the interests of the creditors and the the shareholders and give those interests, whether it's a conflict, give those uh, uh, different interests appropriate weight. Uh, and that's likely to change as the company uh, becomes more and more financially distressed. Um, Lord Briggs used the analogy of a tunnel where there was a, where there was a bright light at the end of the tunnel as in financial uh, sort of recovery was 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 likely, then it may be that the creditors' interests are given little weight. But when the light at the end of the tunnel reduces to a pinprick, then far more weight would need to be given to creditors' interests uh, to the detriment of of the members. Um, La Lady Arden adopted a rather different formulation. She she preferred the idea that the duty was not to harm the creditor's uh, interests. And she, she, she said that that accorded better 
with their decided authority. Um, but it also had the benefit of um, discouraging insolvency deepening conduct by the directors, that's to say, um, uh, the, the final throw of the dice that uh, allows the company to engage in a high risk activity, which if it comes good, will, um, will will benefit the members. But if it doesn't, it will only harm the creditors. So the no harm, do no harm approach would, would promote that uh, or promote a regime where that kind of conduct was suppressed. Um, uh, and, and for her, that was that was uh, a good reason for maintaining uh, or, or, or have it, have it described in the duty as a duty not to harm interests. Uh, what all five members of the Supreme Court were agreed upon, however, is that when insolvent liquidation or administration uh, becomes inevitable, the members cease to have any economic interest in the company, and it is at that point it, it is at that point in time that their interests. The creditors' interests become paramount uh, for the for the purposes of the directors considering what course of action they are to take. Yeah, uh, just just one thing I I, I sort of I, I didn't mention in the context of the the um, subsection one seven two three, which is the um, requires the or expressly says that the duty to promote the success of the company is um, takes effect subject to any um, rule of law about the regards to, to creditors. And as I, as I think I did say, um, for Lord Briggs, um, uh, that was a, a reason for, for recognising the existence of the duty. And, and whereas Lady Arden um, was less certain about that and, and said that almost you had to read that provision as if it said, if any, any uh, rule of law existed. Um, what, what Lord Briggs said about that was that um, by the by not including words such as if any, um, Parliament must be taken to have understood uh, the general state of the common law at the time, including West Mercia, which is a rather touching fiction that he would expect Parliament to be uh, fully aware of. Every member of the House of Commons who voted and so forth to be aware of um, uh, uh, all that case law, including West Mercer, I suspect none of them was aware of it at all. And it rather sort of calls to mind that that old quip about two things you should never see being made: sausages and legislation. Um, so far as um, the conclusion is concerned, um, there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff in this chapter. And as Jamie said, it's it's well over 120 pages. It's not altogether easy to to reconcile all the judgments on every issue. Um, I mean, I think what you can, you, you can identify um, those aspects where they did agree, and, and in a sense, they almost confined themselves to such as you'd expect to such issues as were necessary to dispose of the appeal. Um, I mean, the very fact that the the hearing took place back in May 2021, and even allowing for things like COVID, the the delay um, in producing the judgment, and the the variance of views within it, and and the the scope of the uh, learning shows, I think, that, um, that, that I don't know how strong the, the, the disagreement was or if there was any significant, uh, you know, sort of shouting matches about the, the form of this judgment, but it did take a long time to produce. Um, I mean, the key takeaways are that, um, as, as Jamie said, uh, no freestanding duty owed to creditors and certainly one uh, and, and such duty as there is owed isn't owed um, at uh, where, the, the, where there is a risk of um, insolvency at some time in the future, even if that risk is is not remote, um, and so there's a lot that's left over for future argument, uh, and particularly in relation to the the trigger point and and even the scope of the duty. Um, so um, it's quite a good thing in a way because obviously that's what keeps lawyers busy arguing about what wasn't settled, um, and. Um, so watch this space, I think, is, is the key message there. Um, I, I mean, it, it is, a, it is a, a long, to read it, I don't know how many people have read it, um, but it is, is quite a time consuming thing. And you, you're constantly going back to other paragraphs and trying to, to see um, what, what others have said. In fact, there's one paragraph, that, one point that Jamie pointed out, where Lord, uh, with Lady Arden purports to agree with something Lord Briggs has said, but neither of us can find that in Lord Briggs's judgment. But, Perhaps he was, I hadn't mind an earlier draft or something, I don't know. But, 